Hi there. I met Daniel Patrick O'Reilly as an Airbnb guest in my house. He stayed here a couple days. We had a great time talking and I said to him, you gotta be on my podcast. So he agreed. It's a really lively episode. He's got some really funny stories and some really interesting ones too. I think you're gonna enjoy this. As you're listening, either before or after, if you like it, leave a comment, hit the like button, and please, Hit that subscribe button, will you? It really helps me out. Thanks a lot, guys. Wilkinson here. Today, my guest is Daniel Patrick O'Reilly. Say hi to my peeps. Hey, peeps. Hey, Wilkinson's peeps. <laughs> so, Daniel Patrick O'Reilly, that, that's uh, Italian, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Deep-blooded. Huh. Uh, heavy in the uh, mafia, actually. Yeah, really. So, how Irish are you? My mom's father was 100% German, I believe. Hauser was his, so her maiden name is Hauser. Uh, but her mother was 100% Irish, O'Brien. And my that grandmother's parents both had O'Brien as their last name. So there also could be some possible incest too. <gasps> Maybe. O'Brien's a really popular Is that why you have name. these little quirks you have? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. That explains a lot. Maybe I should wow. dive further into that deeper. I've, I feel like it's just been kind of ignored. But All right. Let's jump in the deep end of the pool here. So, <laughs> so who are you? Why don't you tell us a little about you and then we'll go, then I'll jump in. I am a handsome, charming prince from a faraway land. No. Oh, that, uh, well, that, maybe that's actually. LA, right? Yeah, LA. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I'm 36 years old. I've lived in California since 2009, originally from the East Coast. So I spent my formative years in my youth up until 22, up until I graduated from college in the Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts area. And then, yeah, moved out to California and realized I never had to shovel snow again in my life and stayed. But I split time originally. My first five years were up in the Bay Area and then uh, quickly moved down to L.A. to warmer suns and temperatures. You don't like that gray and the fog and all that stuff. It was great coming from the East Coast right. because I wasn't used to that at all. Okay. But uh, so you once I did, you you stepped down the stairs. So first there, and then into yeah. the sunny southern. California. I'm not sure where to go from here to warmer. Maybe something tropical. But uh, I've made LA my my home currently. Cool. Yeah. So what kind of family background do you have? Traditional Irish Catholic family, 100. percent I was one of four, three sisters, second oldest. My parents were super young. They are in their early 60s. I think my mom is 60 and my dad is maybe 62. It could be off by a year. They had kids, all four of us, before 30. I think my dad was 32 when my youngest sister was born. Wow. Um, but my mom, I think, had just turned 30. So a very young family, very tribe-like in that I wasn't just raised by my parents, but I was raised by uh, extended family um, as well. Aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, um, friends. It was... Uh, very much a community-based upbringing, which I loved. The house was rambunctious. I mean, wall inside as well, but my mom had a daycare growing up. So we raised kids as well, other people's kids in the house. So it was just this, uh -huh. the door was always open to any family member. So it was very much an upbringing in that vein where there's, you didn't have any privacy. I didn't really know what privacy was really, really growing up. Uh, that was something I was I would learn more in adulthood. Did you have your own room? I did because I was the only male. Okay. But did like people knock? No. <laughs> no. Uh, also, like you know, it's a small house, so you are constantly hearing things. And there's, I it was always funny in high school when my friends and I would be you know drinking. We end up like like sleeping over. They would always know how, like, right at 6 a.m., 7 a.m., some little kid was coming crashing through the door. For the daycare? For the daycare. And, like, yeah. that was the reality. But, yeah, so that was very much my, my upbringing was family and friends and lots of people always around. And I was very social as a kid as well, always trying to get the neighborhood kids together, playing kick the can, playing manhunt, 
always kept busy riding on a bicycle. I felt like I was raised in almost my parents' generation of thought, which was, was dinner time is at 5.30. What you do with your time is yours. Just come back at 5.30. Um, huh. And yeah, so it was every, every meal was always prepared at 5.30 and you were home for dinner. Dinner was always a fascinating experience of someone trying to make somebody laugh and someone's nose getting flooded with milk and someone having to like sprint to the bathroom because they're about to pee their pants so it was i think a very um very fun like yeah, it sounds fun. child upbringing even though we were we didn't have a lot i didn't realize that until i was a little bit older but we didn't have a lot but what we had in love and all the important things was you know a constant flow huh. learning now in my 30s thinking back now that I'm in my 30s and thinking back to like what my parents did, it was very much their lives were dedicated towards us and our experience uh, as kids versus like the need to go out or party or whatnot. Plus, I think a lot of their community and their friends all had young kids as well. It was like just very much right what was going on because I can't imagine myself having four kids right now. That right. to me really? is... Are your parents still with us? Mm-hmm. Both still here. They're about to celebrate 40 years. So they're together. Mm-hmm. Good Catholics. Good Catholics. Better and worse. I think they're, they're best friends, ultimately. I think they Are have they? a lot of fun together, for That's sure. Cool. Uh, have been through it, too. And nothing was... Things were kept from us, but never in, like... We always knew things were, like, going on. And there's, you know, shifts in relationships. And even when things were shifting, I never... I saw my parents, I think... Probably around the time I came out, I started seeing them less as parental figures, but more as like people. That... Wait, you came out? Oh, you're gay? Oh, I'm a raging homosexual. You are? Mm. Oh. I've had a couple of those on my podcast. Ah, <laughs> is that because you're also uh, a raging shh, homosexual? Shh. Oh, oh, we're not supposed to talk about that. The paintings on the wall don't know. I don't want them. Mm. Don't don't the expose me to them. Headless naked, naked man <laughs> figure I'm... That's a candle. Right Someone oh, a gave candle. it to me. Oh, okay. yeah. It's supposed to be very zenny. <laughs> the, the, he's got a busty bust. Well, he, the guy, the guy that gave it to me, it was a house guest, and he said that when you, I said there's no head on this thing, and he said, well, when you light it, the flame is the head. Oh. Oh. Okay. Interesting. That's cool. Yeah. Very it's interesting. Cool. I like it. I haven't used it yet. I don't like burning candles down, then it wrecks them. But mm. Whatever. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, that's their purpose as well, mm. though. How did your Catholic family take you coming out? It was a lot of mixed feelings. My my town was pretty liberal, socially liberal, Connecticut town. So there were gay people around, mostly I would say lesbians and, and gay men. Like some of my teachers were, were gay and out. So and the curriculum, although it was a very white town, was like very much diversity was was pushed. And economically, economically it was pretty diverse. We had very wealthy people and we also had um, not as like wealthy people. A full spectrum, um, for sure, for like a suburb. Um, but my father took it really well. He's hmm. kind of a straight-laced man. It is what it is, and you're kind of in charge of your own life, is sort of his philosophy. He was a parole officer, so he um, dealt with people that were coming in and out of the prison system, um, and a lot of his parolees were lesbians. So he had exposure to this world. Oh. Plus, I think... It almost legitimized sort of where our relationship was at and how we never really saw eye to eye on on common interests. So when I was younger, you know, for him, sports was life. ESPN was God. Wow. Um, Him and his brother grew up right around the, the original ESPN building is in Connecticut and it was near their hometown. And they would spend every single morning watching these programs over and over and over and over again to the point where I didn't realize it. But my he had my dad had gotten a trivial pursuit, like sports edition. And my cousin was just like riddling off all the questions to him. And he was like, answer, answer, answer. And I'm like, wow, about any like sport thing. It's just like that is what him and his brother consumed when they would we would drive by the building, the ESPN building he would bow down to it and like we were you know in the car being like what are you doing like that is like so bizarre but it was it was his mecca and it was his way of communicating and wow uh the how i've understood the straight male 
bravado is like very much wrapped in in sports wow. um and their emotions are sort of wrapped up in sports i didn't care for it at all i was also this tiny tiny little kid at least two years like my growth chart i was two years younger i was like the average but two years younger wow um so people would read like uh, for soccer for example i was away on vacation when they had like tryouts or something. And they just took me on the the better team because they split it up by like age demographics. And I was older, I was one of the older kids in my class. So they thought, oh, okay. And the reason my parents held me back was for sports. They thought I would, it would give me more time to like mature and whatever. And my that was what my dad was hoping for. My dad is six foot two, six foot one, six foot two. His brother's the same height as him. So my the expectation for me to be this like large dominating. So you will bloom it someday. Yeah. Someday. Yeah. That was a common thing uh, at the doctors of like, oh, you're you're. It's just going to be late for you. It's just going to be. You're the last flower. He'd have this whole story about a lotus tree. (laughs) I was like, man, like save your breath. I've heard this now for like four years straight. Like, it's not happening yet, doc. Like it is what it is. But so I was always promised this like uh, growth spurt that never that never really came. I was always athletic. I could always handle my own in sports. I'm very good at like backyard sports and um, like things like archery and, and axe throwing and um, yeah, really stra- like strange stuff like that. I, I do really well at, but um, like the traditional sports of like baseball never really intrigued me. Plus I was attracted to my entire team and we'd be in all these like, <laughs> you know, tight pants out in the field. Like that's, People don't realize, like, as a gay man in sports, you're around these, like, pheromones and, and, like, you have attraction. And now you're having to, like, deal with that on top of, like, the stress of the actual sport. I always applaud gay athletes that are on, like, team-oriented sports. Is, sports. So I was oh. always good, but I was never good enough to be what my father wanted me to be, which was, like, on the travel team. And he wanted to be friends with all, like, the parents that were in that. My right. sisters, all great. Well... The younger ones especially, or the one right below me was like the top athlete of her of her class. Wow. So he got that experience, I think, but it just didn't come from where he thought it was going to come from. Right. Where I was a lot more into the arts. Uh, the first play I auditioned for, I did it behind my parents' back, my middle school play. I just went in with one, my friend. And the director asked, where have you been? Because uh, our middle school is four years, so it was fifth through eighth. He said, where have you been? And I was like, I don't know. I didn't, you know, this wasn't on my radar either. I was something where, I was always intrigued Where have you with. been as in, we like you, we like you, you. should have yeah, been doing this? Yeah, I got cast this. as like one of the leads. It was my first audition. I got cast as one of the leads. So it was just... Wow. Um, Did they ever tell him you were in it? Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I got cast and I had the rehearsal schedule. I was like, fuck, like I need to... So I went to them. They're like, oh, we didn't even realize you're doing this. Are you sure you want to do this? Like it's going to compete with sports. all these <laughs> sports schedules. And I was like fine with me. Like (laughs) I'm down like basketball. I don't really care. Like let's do this instead. So I started gaining some autonomy on my life very early. And ultimately looking back, I was like, oh, I was this alien child to my parents. Like (laughs) they had no idea how to cultivate or relate or relate. My mom's side was very musically inclined. So like there was some things there, but that that was not something that necessarily Elaine that she took up. So like the fact that I was doing, it was just a bit foreign to everyone involved. And I had, you know, all these cousins that were nearby that were very much hitting those, those common tropes of being on the basketball team and the travel team. And, you know, well, you said your father took it well when you came out. So what yeah, about, he took it well because I, I think for um, what I was getting at before I completely went off on a tangent, <laughs> but which will happen, is that it made sense to him finally. Like it was like, okay. oh, okay, all these years we've tried to like really bond on these things and he's and, never really showed interest. Oh, it's because he's gay. That is a stereotype, right. but it was a stereotype <laughs> that happened to sort of have truth in it. And for him, I think... His response was, oh, it's whatever the year was. It's 2007. Like, I'm past whatever these, like, weird tropes are. However, my mother had a daycare at home. She didn't necessarily have the same interactions or the same world space. Um, And for her, she was fine initially, and everyone kind of went off on their way. My sisters didn't give a fuck uh, because I said it at dinner. The the whole (laughs) thing was actually pretty funny. I had one of my girlfriends with me who's black and they thought I was about to say that I was, I, she was pregnant or I was engaged to her. So like oh my they gosh. were on like a completely different. Wait, how old were you here? Uh, I was a senior or a junior, no, sophomore in college. 
So it was 20. Okay. It oh was, my gosh. The semester was about to end. What did you have for dinner? <laughs> honestly, I do not remember. I was uh, I know we okay. grilled that day because uh, my girlfriend, Sylvia, ended up talking to my dad. And we the story we had come up with was we were traveling from Providence to head down to like meet her family in Long Island. She's from Massachusetts. Okay. But we were going to stop back up because we had to go back to um, Providence. To We were on some special club that we had to stay through commencement. So we had to drive back up and Connecticut is, or my hometown was sort of in the middle of, so we would just stop in for dinner. So, so did you plan? Was this planned? It was planned. Like, I mean, for me it was planned, but I didn't want to give them any sort of like hint at what heads I was up, coming, yeah, heads up. Yeah, yeah. And I thought through like, oh, this is like an excellent plan, but it was received <laughs> that – Oh, Dan's bringing home his girlfriend. Dan has something to tell us. Like, this is like, you know, there's some sort of importance here. Why is he stopping here to whatever? So the whole family was there and we're grilling. And my dad starts grilling her or like talking. My dad um, on the side has like a, a car business where he drives people down to the airport. Our hometown is like far enough away that's too, right. like Ubers are too expensive and taking the right. train is a hassle. So he was talking about all the different like bridges that he takes to get to Long Island. And my poor girlfriend is just like in like panic mode of like, I don't know. And then just like agreeing. She was just agreeable. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he might be like, oh, I like take the Tappan Zee bridge. To, like, and I, right. She had no idea. Like he was just trying to relate to her in, in the way that he knew how. But we get to the dinner table. Everything's sort of set. And she ends up at the end of the table. And I see her at one point because I'm, I'm stalling. I'm stalling. I'm not like, you know freaking out and she knows what you're she gonna do she knows right? what i'm about yeah. to do yeah instead of getting up and getting a glass of water which means that she would have had to pass by everyone to get to the kitchen she takes a, her purse out grabs a water bottle out of her purse and pours it into her glass so i could tell she's freaking out and then everyone starts to get up from the table and i was like wait i have some news to tell you and i could see my sister like give me this like weird face and i was like i'm gay and everyone's like what and i was like i'm a homosexual and everyone like <laughs> slowly sits back down. <laughs> like sits back down and i had brought like to in their defense i had brought home all these girlfriends and and whatnot and i dated girls and they were like are you sure how do you know and i was like well dad you're attracted to mom you have feelings for her like i don't get those feelings for women um i get them for men like so it's like trying to explain horniness to my father and without <laughs> mentioning the word horny you know how you get in your body with that. Like, I don't get that for women. I get that for men. My sister, my, sorry, my mom's sister had dated women. Okay. But ended up with a man. And so her experience of it was, oh, this is just a, a phase, phase. A phase, yeah. Are you sure this isn't a phase? And I was like, I don't need a boyfriend to tell you how I feel. Um, and this is how I've felt for a very long time. And I was very confused by it. Um, and I didn't know how you guys would react and sort of like, breaking it into that right we i get up from the table i had to go to my godmother who's essentially a second parent to me to go tell her so we, i left for that and apparently when i left everyone kind of just milled about and my mother stayed at the table and then like broke down into like tears and started crying and like had this like how did i not know how is everyone okay and my dad i th th what it got relayed back to me was my dad had said to her you said you were fine with this because he's like straightforward you know is what it is. Right. And she's like, I'm not fine with this. How is that? Like, everyone's just going about like, what? And, you know, so she is a lot more emotional. It takes her time to process. Right. Her big thing was she was definitely raised a lot more Catholic. She went to Catholic school growing up. So there was like some homophobia that sort of laid in there. There was also the, how did I not know? She watched a lot of soap operas. So like the mothers always know, how did I not know? And I was just like, mom, like, I didn't want you to know. So I made sure you didn't know. Like, this isn't on you. This was like a choice that I was actively making because right. I was out of fear or uh, discovery or just like needing time. So yeah, it was, it was a strange period, a shift that was happening, sort of, they wanted to know how I, it wanted to be communicated to the rest of the family. And they weren't necessarily the best advocates for me. However, when other gay people were dealing with like coming out in my hometown, they were excellent. So it was like huh. they had like gone through it and been through it. Yeah, they had the experience. And they had the experience. Right. And I wouldn't say mine was terrible because I've definitely had some friends that it was like really bad. Right. They got disowned like X, Y, and Z. But it was an adjustment period for everybody. I think 
my parents, and this is common, I think, had a lot of hopes and dreams for me. And I had always projected myself in a particular way where I was going to accomplish a lot right. of those things that they dreamt uh, for me. And ultimately, my parents just want to be grandparents. They just right. want grandkids. So I think they, in that moment, I shattered all of those dreams. And while it took me, you know, 10 years. Or to they thought it was right. shattered. Yeah. Right. Or well, no. Those dreams, those dreams were well, shadowed. That, in that, in like, that sense, in yeah. that sense. But you certainly could have kids. Sure. Yeah. Well, at the time, gay marriage wasn't legal. Right. Right. Gotcha. Gay people really didn't have kids unless you know uh, they had had kids from like a previous marriage or from right. with a woman. And and one of the questions that got asked right away, which for me was such an old trope, was, "Are you going to die of HIV? Are you going to die of AIDS?" That was one of the first things that like came out of their mouths. And I was just like. At the dinner table? At the dinner table. Oh, they did. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because all of what they knew were men that died of AIDS. And they were all in New York. And, you know, they'd hear all these stories and whatnot. uh, A lot on like personality types and flamboyancy and this, that, the other thing. Like those were very much like the appearance of it all was a concern. And I was like, I don't know. Like I still feel the same. Like I think I've through my process of sexuality and coming out to myself and getting comfortable with just who I am, have tendencies of flamboyancies and have tendencies of masculinities and sort of see it as all like all encompassing. But for them, it was like, you know, we don't want you to be this like flaming attention seeker. Is no what high they, heels of the high, Christmas exactly. party. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and I was like, at the time I was like, well, I can't walk in high heels. Like I like clumsy, like that. that's like not going to be a thing. Right. But I don't know, like I can't predict the future either. But yeah, so it was, it was a fascinating transition. But overall, I think the family responded to it well and was very much curious about my life in a way that I think they always had been before, but in, an, in a new way, in a new light. Like, what what's Dan going to do now? Well, speaking of that, you've done a few things. Mm. <laughs> I'm talking out of the relationship mm. arena here. So what are some of the jobs or things you've done? I've lived many lives in my... 35 years. Uh, right out of college, I taught I taught middle school science in a, a low-income area in California. That's what brought me out to California. I was stuck as a 22-year-old in a class sizes of like upwards to 55 kids teaching science. And it was wild. It was wild. Uh, Wait, you had 55 kids in a class? I had over 190 students total. There's it, no way. What's an ideal class size? Like 20-something? Mm-hmm. My lowest class size would be 32, and I loved that class. It was, just, it was wild. The, at the time, 2008, 2009, 2010, California was in a financial crisis. I mean, the, the world was, or the U.S. was, and all of the teacher contracts were stripped. So, And they changed from a class cap to a school class average cap. So you'd have special ed classes that had three, four, or five people which meant that you can overload on other classes because if the average was still at like, I think 32, then you were, you were good. You were certified as a school. So they gave the 28 kids from special ed and dumped them in yours. I had the special ed kids. We didn't have special ed for science or for history. So for math and English, their class sizes were a little bit smaller because the special education uh, students would be um, removed from class. But they would throw them into the science class. So I was like, all right, like I'm dealing with kids that had reading levels from first grade to I had some pretty advanced students up to like probably like ninth grade, all in a seventh grade class. And I'm teaching them science for the first time. Wow. Um, So it was pretty it was pretty wild. Uh, That was my background, though. I went to school to become a doctor. I was pre-med and teaching was always like a, a, a natural thing. Again, growing up with that many people, I raised kids in a sense. So it was always some lesson was to be learned. Someone was, you know, some lesson being taught either to me or me to them. Right. So if you were pre-med, was the teaching gig part of that? No. Or or did you take a side track here? uh, Sort of. So there was a program that was going around to colleges at the time and still to this day called Teach for America. Um, And they took their purpose was to incentivize top tier students out of the top universities and colleges to go into a school for two years, a low income school for two years, and to put them in education to better our education system. Because at the time, a lot of those people were going into tech companies and going to med school and going to law school. And and the talent of teachers was um, diminishing, especially in urban populations um, and urban schools and rural schools. 
that was the program and okay. it was prestigious and it was something that I thought was like a great thing to have on your resume and a great thing to be a part of. And I drank the Kool-Aid and I was like, <laughs> all right, like this seems like a good track. I didn't necessarily do well my freshman year. At the time I was also acting um, as well at the school. So I, my time was very limited and I, I excelled in high school and then my freshman year almost flunked out. So I had some some time to make up from that. So I started thinking, okay, if medical school is not going to be for me, what are some other options? And Teach for America sort of came into scope. By the end, I graduated cum laude and like did really well, straight A's across the board. And once I sort of gave up acting for a little while, it was like very much school and studying and, and on the right track for me at that time. But Teach for America had come into my scope. A lot of people before me that I graduated before me loved the program had a lot of great things to say. I saw it as, okay, this is like my my gap years to like figure out what I wanted to do right. while I was still doing something that was considered prestigious and, and um, helping the community. And I was a shoe and I got in early. I was accepted early. I had all, like my resume was, was sort of set in that way and guided itself towards it. So, plus they were always looking for math and science teachers. I think it was a lot easier to get accepted to the program. So that's what brought me out to California. So I did that for a couple of years. And while that very much explored medicine still, uh, in between my two years, I went to Uganda and lived there for three months uh, working with a rural nursing school slash uh, medical facility. Uh, what, what did you do there? I taught classes. I was teaching biochemistry classes to their nursing school and then also uh, building a community garden, different schools, and I got to participate in surgeries. Um, as well. Are you qualified to do I that? I am 100% not qualified to do anything, <laughs> but I was a white male and a white coat was put on me and I was I had access to everything. What you're envisioning of in terms of like a surgery in a surgical room, this was not that. We're like single room, door open, flies coming in. Were things sanitized? Were things not? It was me and a doctor from Kenya in Uganda in this like very rural community probably about like 20 minutes from the Tanzania border, people that had medical emergencies came to this place to die, wow. essentially, because they didn't, they didn't have the, the facilities to handle any sort of emergency. What they did have and what they were able to treat was tuberculosis and malaria. And these smaller surgeries, the, one, the ones I participated in were both genital-based. Uh, one was um, a circumcision on a 35-year-old man Ouch. Yeah. Uh, and the second was uh, removing clots from a, uh, a, a vagina. A woman had a lot of like blood clots and they were essentially more or less pumping them out of her. But it gave me uh, very much a f front row seat to like what the medical world was like outside of the U.S. and also outside of cities. I always kind of lived near cities right. and had access to really great yeah. medical care. Well, what would somebody like with a broken leg, what would happen to them? Depending if it just was like a, um, like a so hairline. There's a bad broken leg with a. Death could happen. Yeah. The skin. Oh yeah. Wow. The doctor would do it all he can, but if it severed any sort of like artery, like absolutely not. Wow. So yeah, like thing, things, things like. Did the doctor not know what he was doing that way or did he just, he was overwhelmed and couldn't do it all? I would actually say it, I mean, a little bit of both. It was the. There wasn't a lot going on there, but you didn't have a lot of things like supplies and you worked with what you had. Right. So if something was as bad as that, I'm, you know, he had local anesthesia, so he would, you know, have that or numb that part of the leg, reset the leg, but there's no x-ray. There's no wow. MRI. Like wow. there's none of that. So it's very much a, a very simple simple place. So you were there three months? I was there three months. I got malaria twice. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the first time I was on a trip to Rwanda coming back and I was super low energy and my throat hurt and I had had strep throat a lot as a kid. So I was like, this is strep throat. Walked into the malaria can be treated really well. It's a protist. So it's not a bacteria or a virus. You used to learn in science class about like, usually they were green diatoms and, uh, things of that species. Those are all protists. Uh, there was one, a paramecium that sort of looked like a penis, uh, <laughs> the shape of a penis. Anyway, a different kingdom of uh, organisms, usually single cell or like multi-cell, but um, like stacked. Right. They and usually live in the 
the ocean. This one is a two vector system. They they need a host, which is uh, both human and mosquito. The mosquito hatches the larvae, and then the mosquito injects the malaria, recently hatched malaria, into your system. Those larvae chew your red blood cells, which deliver oxygen to your body. That's the purpose so of red blood cells. So that's what slows you so down. So that's what slows you down. That's right. what gets you exhausted. What people don't realize is your body's always regenerating red blood cells. So you'll like take a nap. And you wake up and you'll feel super refreshed and ready to go. And because then you just a few hatched hours later, a bunch of new ones. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. What's great about malaria and why it's not like a complete killer is the larvae. So they can't reproduce inside your body. They can reproduce. They can hatch or they can have larvae in there. Like I, I think I still have technically larvae in my system. Um, That's gross. Yeah, super gross. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of organisms, right? They we right. live with. I yeah. probably don't want to know about them. No, yeah. No, no. But they can't hatch there. They need the nose of a mosquito or of a very particular mosquito. So really? it has to work within those systems. When you are going to these countries that have things like this, you get vaccinated. And I got vaccinated, and you know, taking right. anti-malarial pills and whatnot. But so the, why didn't it work? The nurse told me the travel nurse was like, or warned me. You're going to a specific region, Uganda, uh, where there are a lot of different like species. Variations. Variations yeah, that yeah. we don't know necessarily about. So good luck. Oh. <laughs> Nobody else really got it. One kid got it early on. He had been to Tanzania before and had malaria. So I think when you have the larvae in your system, it's a lot easier. Like if I would go back, I could get it a lot easier. A single mosquito could bite you, a larva can go on, hatch it can bite you again, it injects the the newly hatched larvae. So is this like a living thing still in you or is it like dead bodies floating around in you? It's the potential for life is there as the way I would put it. Well, when you said you still have it, what what form are they? Larvae. So like, like eggs. Right. So they're just they're. ready to pop out. Yeah. <laughs> Oof. Yuck. They just need to be baked. It's like, think of it like a dragon egg, right? A dragon egg just needs to have that heat there or that like the necessary conditions and boom, you get a dragon. A thing so larvae is the egg? Yeah. I thought it was the thing that crawled out of the egg. I think this, this was, that's how they like phrased this was like, this was like the larvae. This was like the, okay. the life cycle that it was in. Okay. All right. Oof. That's from what I remember. And I mean, it was a long time ago, so we'd right. have to definitely fact check right. that. So... When you spent the three months, which sounds like it was really interesting, you came home. How did how did that change you coming back to the U.S.? As a gay man specifically, so gay um, homosexuality was uh, illegal. I don't know if it still is. It probably is in Uganda. So, but like they do culturally, like men hold hands. So it's strange because culturally we don't hold hands here, um, or that would be like a, a a tell of a homosexual. But there they do. So there's a lot of like men on man contact physical contact but i was very aware hyper hyper village vig, vigilant to make sure i didn't say or do something that might have like but for the most part when you're there no one's ass, like it's assumed you're straight no matter what your personality etc i met some fl like flaming men where i was like oh man like you are a homosexual <laughs> but like everyone treats them the same because the, the assumption that is that everyone's straight coming back from that was tough to adjust i remember walking to a gay bar and being like oh god like and having this like Reactive. trouble. Yeah. yeah. Oh fuck. Like I'm, I'm not supposed to be here. This, this shouldn't be happening. So that was definitely an adjustment. I had a lot of like digestional issues too at the time, like going from there to here. It's so, like there was, it was interesting going into like my doctor's office and being like, I had malaria twice. And all of a sudden I was like this very interesting patient <laughs> uh, at the time too. I went back into teaching my second year and they were doing a lot of construction and I was getting these massive headaches. So I was also going in to check on that. And then I had this thing come up, uh, coital cephalgia. It stands for sex headaches. I was getting sex headaches. So at the point of orgasm, it would feel like someone would take a bat over my head. And it was like, so I was dealing with like some things that was from travel. And Is that an emotional thing? Mm -mm, they don't know. There's not a lot of uh, data. Or at the time, there wasn't a lot of data. My... Um, it's the second time it was happened in my life, happened once in college, where like there was a period of a month where I couldn't masturbate or I couldn't orgasm because I was going to get a migraine. And not a 15 minute migraine, but like you're out for a Just day. Just sharp pain. Yeah. 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 Like all the lights had to be off, had to like needed complete silence. Wow. Migraine. Um, so I was dealing with a lot. But I was also 23 and could deal with a lot. And I was just like, this is right. what life is. And this is like the discovery of life and, and whatnot. Um, and enough of like strange things had happened to me up at like to this point as well with like medical stuff where I was like, all right, this is going to be for the rest of life. Like you're just going to deal with things. You're going to have to deal with things. 
so yeah, it was just more so just navigating right back in. But yeah, it was a little tough adjustment coming back and then going right into teaching. At the time, I was still possibly looking into medical school, so I joined up with a gay men's health collective in Berkeley and, and helped and volunteered and did their lab work. So it was like reading for signs of STIs and, and whatnot. So thrusted myself into there. And I think by the end of it, I transitioned out of teaching. My principal was leaving. My best friend was leaving. She taught the eighth grade section. And I was just like, I don't want to keep doing this. Like I'm making, I think I was making $32,000 a year for class size, outrageous class sizes and, and, and no help. Wow. This isn't, it wasn't sustainable. I loved my kids. I thought they were super cool. I thought seventh grade was wild uh, time, but I, I related to them in a way that like, I'm glad I didn't teach high school, but yeah, I was, I, I thought something would have clicked by then of, I need to, this is why I'm going to medical school. Like I'm going to be passionate about this. I'm, I've now done Studied all stuff, it yeah. and all this stuff leading up to it. And it just didn't click. My second year, they asked me to teach an elective, an extra class. And I was like, well, I did drama all my life. Why not? Why not do that? Why not teach an acting class? And my kids started pointing it out to me. They would be like, Mr. O, that were in both classes. You love this <laughs> way more <laughs> than you science. love teaching science. Yeah. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, <laughs> what? Do your homework. Like, no, like. But they were, they were, I just didn't know how to navigate that world. I wasn't on that track. I remember having uh, uh, conversations with friends from college as we were leaving and they were like, if you could do something else, what would you do? And I was like, you know, I'd really like to like explore what acting would, would look like. I've loved it as a kid. I was told I had like a natural talent towards it, entertainment, whatnot. Why not? Why not give it a go? Um, and I guess this was my chance so I stopped teaching. I started applying for other jobs in education, like nonprofit stuff. They wouldn't even look at my resume. So all of a sudden, this thing that I was told about Teach for America, you would be hireable, blah, blah, blah. Not at all. Really? All these education jobs in the Bay Area at the time required you to have graduated from an Ivy League school or they weren't looking at your resume. It's a really tough job market. I had worked in restaurants before, so I was like, all right, might as well look for a restaurant job. I uh, found one of those and then found um, an apartment in San Francisco with some wonderful people that were in the restaurant industry. So like my world was starting to shape in that capacity. And I had all this time, so I started going to these auditions that I would find on Craigslist. Now you'd think, oh, okay, like porn. No, I wasn't doing any porn yet, no. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> I went to my first audition. It was for a student film out there and I booked it. I was like, all right. That's kind of cool. I'm one for one. Like, right. excellent. Go on set. And my co-star, I was like, how do you do this? Like, I don't like, I just found this on Craigslist. Like, how do you? And so he showed me all the different like casting websites and submissions and whatnot. And you had to like upload your photos. And I didn't have any photos. Instagram maybe had just started, but like right. the, the idea of a selfie was like, hadn't really even come to yeah. to, to start and to, to, into the cultural zeitgeist. But I had photos from a friend when we took a trip from Southern California to Northern California. She like took some like fun, like modeling as shot. We were just having fun on the right. beach. She took some photos and I was like, all right, throw those in as my like headshots. And I started getting work. Wow. Um, and I, the, it sort of just un, unfolded itself to me. Bay Area had a, a great need for actors. There were a lot of tech companies that were looking to create videos and they didn't have a lot of television shows that you'd see, you know, on you know, some sort of network, but they had these smaller gigs and there was a massive theater scene. And so I just threw myself into it. I think I booked my first national commercial six months after that original uh, booking from the what short film. What product were you yeah. peddling in that? What was it? What product were you peddling? It was for Auto Nation. It was a car commercial. Okay. And I was a like San Francisco hipster with a <laughs> my fiance. And the story arc was I was recreating a photo of my grandfather standing in front of the Golden Gate Bridge. Okay. So she's like positioning the camera and like I'm holding it up and we're having like a cute moment and... Um, it was really sweet and, and wonderful. And for me, like the audition process was just like any other audition. At that point, I wasn't booking every single one. Like they're, you know, I got rejected for sure. But because there weren't a lot of people that looked like me um, in acting, I had good, like a great chance to, and I worked for some great companies. I worked for Google. I worked uh, for AutoNation. Like it was just, it was a cool experience. 
But as this was happening, as I was getting involved and getting written up in like the community and doing a lot of community theater, that's when people from LA started reaching out. Hey, you should be down there. Friends, Connects um, had seen the commercial. Some agencies had reached out as well. And I was like, you know what? If not now, when? So I jumped right into it. And I, you know, at this time had worked in restaurants enough and had enough skill set to like work behind a bar and sort of live this like very typical LA life. And I had no idea how long I was going to stay in LA or if it was going to work out. And um, I've been there now almost 10 years. Uh, the acting stuff comes and goes. When I was first down there, my look was very much sought after. I was going out a lot. I wasn't ready at all. I wasn't trained. Uh, everything was like, what I was, what I would just from experience, but I, I didn't do well in front of any sort of theatrical camera. My commercials were great. My theater work was great, but I couldn't take this like large energy that I had, this almost anxious energy that I had and like s- confidently send it out through my eyes. Right. When you are on camera in a television show um, or a movie, you are literally peering into someone's soul. And I didn't have access to my soul. I had, you know, from gay resentment and this and that, like I had pushed all of that and covered all of that. Part of what made me so quirky and and why I was so successful in theater work was I played the zany, quirky character that you never really quite understood right. or like where he was going to go next. You, you was so unpredictable. Directors loved me because I had restraint. So like they trusted it, but the audience member always felt like... <gasps> What's it going to do next? (laughs) So now I had to learn how to take that energy and really focus it. And a lot of that has to do with like understanding who you are. So I signed up for an acting class and was there for three years. And we focused on their focus was sort of peeling that onion. And where you are in real life is where you're going to show up on camera. Oh, really? Sort of his mentality, my acting coach's mentality. So if you were insecure about relationships or love or sex or whatever, that would show up. And if anything shows up in front of the camera people don't believe you. They're looking for an insincere moment. And you can tell. When actors are in it, you can tell that they're in it. When they're not in it, you're like bored. You start, you know, it's 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 not exciting. Huh. It's not fun. It's a voyeuristic medium. Hmm. So it took three years and realized really quickly that I needed lots of therapy because my acting <laughs> coach, my acting coach always say, I'm going to expose your problems and teach you how to use them theatrically, but I'm not going to teach you how to get over them. Yeah, you're not. He's not your therapist. No, yeah. he's there to just rip you open. Right. So that it was just a, a constant of that. And I was, when I do things, I fall into them and I give my all. So for me, I, I saw lots of classmates leave and this and that. Like as soon as he started right. pressing buttons and as soon as he pressed buttons, I just like, opened up more and opened up more. You want me to take boxing classes because you you feel like I need to learn how to get hit? Great, I'm gonna take boxing lessons. You want me to take yoga because you feel like I need to ground, I'm gonna, and so it, it became not just about the acting class, but also about like, how was I shaping and viewing my life? Right. You want me to, to, to have an, ex- I didn't really have a boyfriend at all and up until that experience, I had situationships, but never a relationship. <laughs> you want me to like learn what that, okay, I got a boyfriend and like, all of us, you know, all this other shit would start coming up. Right. And I was like, oh, wow, these are all things that I was struggling with in life and in acting that were huh. um, putting a wall up to the vulnerability. And acting is vulner- like vulnerability. It's just showing all the different colors of humanity and of yourself, using yourself as the instrument. Right. It's not about lying or tricking or, you know, X, Y, Z. It's about finding the humanity in whatever character that you've been tasked with and finding common and love, finding love for that person and and in that person. Why is, and then figuring out why they're making the decisions that they're making. So yeah, it was a fascinating first three years in LA and then it shifted more into, okay, I need to move away from that uh, class specifically in that um, acting studio and get more involved with like therapy and like the woo woo of it all and, and, (laughs) and diving into that world to make myself feel better because I now have access and I now know what's wrong and I've done the memory retrievals and I, it's all there. I see where the pain is, but it is inside my body and I need it out. I can't just like leave it in there. Right. Um, so that that became my next task. I will always say that if no matter how my acting career, how whatever shape it takes, it was I'm never going to regret it because it saved me from myself. Huh. The amount of times I felt suicidal in life or the cyclical depression that I was in, all of a sudden... I couldn't ignore it anymore. For me to achieve what I want to achieve, 
in acting, I couldn't ignore it anymore. I had to bring it to the forefront. And now that it's in the forefront, it's time to like actually take a look at this and figure out and work with professionals to get it out of my body and to be a better, more complete human. So yeah, that was probably a few years before the pandemic started and you know, right. life happens there. And So where's acting today? I'll be in a commercial. For what? For First Five California. They're an organization that helps parents, new parents. The first five is the first five years of life. So okay. they help new parents pretty much up until like kindergarten. They're giving them resources, how to teach your kids, how to deal with tantrums and things like right. that. And they do these like PSA campaigns every year. So, so you what, I got, you're, a, you're a dad, right? I got cast as my first dad role. Daddy. <laughs> uh, it was great. My co-stars were uh, three and a half and four and a half. Sweethearts, to me, terrors to production. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, so, you know, like so? in the magic that you see on the screen is not what's happening behind the scenes. <laughs> it's very much... Wait, 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 wait. Okay, everything's set. Go. And the kid might not be ready. And at the that kid point. is not ready. Yeah. Like at this point, I've trained myself to go from zero to sixty. Right. But a kid. Uh -huh. But a kid, absolutely not. Like no. Like this kid was ready thirty minutes ago. Now she doesn't want to do anything, and I get it. I don't want to do anything. <laughs> She's allowed to have a tantrum. I'm not allowed to have a tantrum. They, I bond really well with kids due to my past and, and whatnot. They thought right. I had, production thought I had kids. By the end, they're like, oh, how old are, you know, how many do you have? And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. I don't, I don't have any, uh, which they found pretty shocking and, and whatnot. Wow. They're, just, they're like, you have a gift. And I was like, no, I, I get it. Like, this is, I was trained to do this since I was, since I was born. But uh, yeah, that should be coming out this month or March, like the campaign was supposed to start. So oh, it'll be on TV. Yeah, it'll be on TV. It'll be on uh, streaming services. I don't know what the actual plan, like you cool. never know. Uh, well, when my first national commercial came out, I didn't know it was out until a friend of mine from Atlanta, saw called, it. my best friend saw it and she like calls me up and she was like, oh, I just saw you on TV. <laughs> and I, oh God, the night before, um, I had gone out with a bunch of bar buddies and I was a little heavy into like the drug scene at that time. And I was sick for a whole bunch of like things that I had taken from the night before. And I'm like, sp like trying to be like involved in this moment that she's so happy for me, but I'm also so ill and about to like be ill for about a week Wow! Um, and not being able to enjoy it, which is a completely like other journey that I took with drugs and near sobriety that I kind of exist in now. But it was just so that's how I knew like they don't they don't announce rarely do they like actually say hey this is like our commercial it's going to be out your once your job is done and you've been paid they're like okay whatever yeah so that'll be out pretty soon and then I'm auditioning I still have an agent uh it's a boutique agency that rep me across the board so I get submissions and a lot of it now is self tapes so right. you don't necessarily have to go in anywhere which I prefer and I can live sort of another life outside right. so yeah i work in i work in alcohol now i no longer work for restaurants or bars and um i now work for brands uh so i'm like your sales rep honestly would have never predicted it i think the last in high school you have to like fill out all those goal sheets and you know and i i think it, the last one you had was at 30 and at 30 according to that i had finished med school i had three kids already and a wife and was living in New England somewhere, ready to have more. Like that was where my head was at. And to, wow. to go from like- you just struck out on all that. <laughs> I mean, wildly so. I mean, I was terrible at baseball anyway, but right. like wildly like massive strikeout where I love my life. I love the things that I'm doing, the, the communities that I'm exposed to, the people that I've surrounded myself with. Oftentimes, you know, it's occasionally I'll do a will miss home. It's but my sisters are having kids themselves. I have now two nieces and two nephews from two separate sisters. Right. Um, some that are older, some that are super young, like babies. And you have this like I feel this pull to be near them, but I'm also I I do love my life. The interesting journeys that it's taken and the stories that I've accumulated and a lot of that was because I'm a gay man. There's no separation of that for me. Like right. As soon as I dabbled into that world, it was like, wow, there's there's just so much more yeah. here that I can see now versus this like normal nine to five life. Right. 
um, which wasn't necessarily for me. It's for some people for sure, right. but I go back home sometimes and I'll, I have a max four day stay <laughs> by the fourth day. I got to get out. Like I either got to take a trip down to New York, Boston, or I need to hail like right back. Cause I see it. I'm, like you get back into this sort of like schedule and for my parents, it makes them happy and they're, they're right. able to accomplish well, that five thirty that... dinner and everything. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> it's not quite the same way now. Has it with changed that. to three thirty now? No. It's, it's not earlier. No, uh, they're just more, they don't have to run a family. Okay. So, although one of my sisters lives with them with two of her kids. So like, they're still, it's still around. Right. But it's, it's, they don't have, they're not in charge of it. Okay. Um, Per se. So yeah, the, it's a lot more loose and, and fast. There's not cool. as much of a rigid structure around it. But um, yeah, now they just want to be grandparents. They just want to like be around right. their kids. So much so, and this is a completely different story, but um, they tried to convince me to donate my sperm to a... They promised my sperm to a lesbian couple that was in town. Who's, who's they? My parents. Your parents promised your sperm. Yep. Unbeknownst <laughs> to me. Unbeknownst to me. And it like turned into this like massive thing that like went well beyond like my boundaries of wow. like, yeah, it was pretty wild. So they are, they have come up with very creative ways to get what they ultimately want, which is one, I think their son back home and two more grandchildren to dote so on. So they were doing that so that that would be their grandkid. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. The wow. way, like the, the short and fast version of it is that the, they had helped. I had mentioned before how my parents were like advocates for other people that were coming out where they're there right. were these two girls in town that ended up dating and, and getting engaged. And my parents were these social champions for them. My understanding, everything was sort of in and around my sister at the time. Both of them were in school, one in grad school, one in undergrad. And they were both working at the same bar, bar restaurant. It was like a seafood lobster place that was right on the water in my hometown. So everything kind of revolved around that, like the social scene and my parents' social scene. Um, now they were hanging out with kids I went to high school with, like it was just a very strange time, transition time, transitional time, energy shift. And yeah, they were like super weird. Those two girls' parents were like not necessarily, they didn't know how to handle it. My parents did. So it was just like, it was normal for them. They could ask all the questions. It wasn't awkward. It wasn't strange. It was, so my family got to know this couple really well. And my parents had taken a couple stories that I had told them. At one point I tried to sell my sperm to like the California Sperm Bank. If you're under 5'10", you are not allowed to. They have a 5'10 really? requirement or 5'9. I'm 5'7 for people that cannot see me, listeners. Well, but, that's, that's totally not fair. I mean, it's a private organization. It's not like a wow. public thing and whatever. I, anyway, I shared that with them. And so they just thought I was giving out my sperm willy nilly, which was kind of true, <laughs> we'll but to men. Some. But, <laughs> but to men, but it wasn't going to copulation. But they had approached them, according to them, jokingly, separately, that if I ever. If they ever needed sperm, just ask me. And I <laughs> knew who these people were because I went to high school with them, but like did not know them to the extent that, you know, I went to high school with them. That was it. Right. They came back to my parents at some like big bash of a party that they were throwing, 4th of July, something like that, and asked my parents if I would consider something like this. And they were like, well, you know, don't you, don't you want like an anonymous sperm donor, which is what they eventually went with. Um, I don't end up with a child at the end of the story. Good. Um, <laughs> they, and they said, well, you guys have been like, we love your family. And like, we've been such like an, an asset to our lives. Like that we'd want you to be a third set of grandparents. Bam. Bam. Like instant tears for my mother. Now everybody is like calling my parents, uh, go by Mima and Poppy to my nieces and nephews. Right. Uh, Cause grandma, they were in their late forties when they became grandparents. So like they were not ready to have grandma and grandpa that felt right. too old. Right. Grandma and grandpa, my grandparents were still alive. Their parents were still alive at that point, but they, it just can't turn into this whole thing where the, now they're being called Mima and Poppy. And they I realized really quickly that if I had done this, it would have united like three different families in town. And like they're all these the three boys that were born, my nephew being one of them, my sister's best friend and her husband's best friend, their child, and then this lesbian couple's child would have all been related had I actually given my sperm, which is was crazy. Like, And I think my parents saw it as an opportunity to for me to have a child, for them to have a grandchild, but also like as super progressive and this like, right. yeah, Dan's going to be like totally down for this idea. Uh, but it completely blew up in everybody's face. So yeah, it was... Was, oh, you don't you don't have regrets that you that you didn't do it, no. do you? No. 
And my father, for the first time recently, mentioned that he was glad that I didn't do it. Good. good. So it took many years, 10, a little less than 10, probably like eight, eight years for him to come back and finally realize where I was coming from. Right. But yeah, I was, especially the following years, it was very stressful. It was, wow. um, uh, it was like therapy porn. Wow. <laughs> you know, but you know, it was a massive lesson in boundaries. And that was right. something that I was learning cool. at the time of like how to establish them. And especially coming from a family where there was no privacy really right. or boundaries. Or boundaries, I was going to say. Uh, yeah. And yeah, it was a hard and fast lesson for wow. sure. So I always wrap these up asking the person sitting across from me, what have you learned? What lesson, life lessons would you like to pass on to my peeps? I think for me, what I've learned is one Life is what you make of it. Whatever energy you put in to something, you'll you'll get the energy back. So whatever you're choosing to do with your life and the people that you're spending with, who you're surrounding with, how you're spending your money is so important to the choose life that you're, you're cultivating. Yeah. So to choose or to to be aware right. of how you're doing those things. To listen to yourself, you ultimately know what's what's good for you, but also surround yourself with people that care and and love you, whether, and just want you to be the best version of yourself. Right. Because I don't think my, I wouldn't be here today if I didn't surround myself with people like that. Very cool. Yeah, this is fun. Daniel Patrick O'Reilly, you're a cool guy. Thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me.